Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse Live. Uh, today we are continuing our verse by verse study through the Gospel of John, and today we are in John chapter 11. So we are starting out with a brand new uh, verse here today. And uh, how are you doing today, Dad? Good. Brand new chapter two. Yep. And a brand new verse. Oh, did I say brand new verse? Yeah, you said brand new verse. Okay, I mean, well, <laughs> yep, uh, unless we're only going through half a verse at a time every week, we usually do start in a brand new verse. But that's what I meant to say, a brand new chapter here today, and that is uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. So if you uh, want to turn your Bibles there, you could do that, and uh, you want to start us off with a prayer. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And Father, we pray for everybody who listens. We pray that you would draw people who are hungry for your word to this ministry of Scripture verse by verse live, and that uh, people would be edified and discipled by the power of your Holy Spirit and your sufficient word, and that above all, Jesus would be glorified. So help us to do that this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's begin our reading in John chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, I don't want to read too much into this. I don't think I am, but I like how God calls Bethany the village or the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It just makes me think about how the presence of Christians is the thing that makes an area important to God. You know, most people would say that Wisconsin is Badger land or Packer land, the home of the Badgers, the home of the Packers, or think of Wisconsin, it's the home of good cheese, um, or maybe some famous citizen. You know, Scott Walker is the governor of Wisconsin, you know, but. You know, but God, I think, would probably say Wisconsin is the home of, and then you can take your pick of any Christian who lives here. That's that's how important God's people are to him. Yeah, and in addition to that, too, you can also see how God notices his people, and he knows details about them. He knows where you live. He knows how you are. And I think that kind of goes back to what we talked about last week when, when Jesus— um, gave the parable of him being the shepherd and we being the sheep and you know the two know each other and uh you know god god knows everything about you um as you just said and and what's important to him is you if you're a christian yeah in verse two it says this was mary who anointed the lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother lazarus was sick you know, this gospel of John was written decades after Mary anointed Jesus with that oil and possibly 60 years after that oil was anointed by Mary or uh, Jesus was anointed with that oil by Mary. 60 years possibly, but for sure decades. But clearly her devotion is still fresh in God's mind. And because he mentions it right here. And it's a reminder that genuine acts of affection from God, I should say to God, from Christians, stay fresh in his mind. I think uh, sometimes maybe, maybe we get the feeling that God doesn't notice these things, but he does, and he doesn't forget them either. Yeah, definitely the things that you do for God uh, do not go unnoticed, and that's a good reminder of that. And the other thing I think of here, too, is that Mary did a good deed for Jesus, as we were talking about, and she came to Jesus and got forgiveness. And uh, likewise, others in her family followed as well, including her brother Lazarus. It was a family affair for them, something that they all had in common was Jesus. And uh, so I just say, you know, you never know who you're going to affect um, because of your walk with Christ, not only to your point, did this get remembered by God, what Mary did, but it also brings Lazarus into the fold and he had a special relationship with Jesus as well. Yeah, he certainly did. We can see that in verse three. 
So the sisters sent word to him, to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is sick. Um, that's kind of a that's kind of a neat title for someone, isn't it? Uh, he who the Lord loves. I mean, to be able to say that to Jesus about someone. Hey, Jesus, he who you love is sick. And that's how he felt about Lazarus. Um, and the ladies, the sisters, send this message to Jesus. And in essence, the message is, Lord, we have a problem. And we thought that you would like to know about it. And it's the one you love is sick. And that was their message to Christ. And they know Jesus. And they trust him to do whatever needs to be done. They're not sure what that will be, but they trust him. They don't say anything else. The, you know, they don't give any, make any other requests. It's just, Lord, the one who you love is sick. And they, you know, they just hand the ball off to Jesus without even getting into any details. That's how much they trust him. Yeah, that's a great point. They didn't they didn't specifically at this point ask for him to come heal Lazarus. They mm -hmm. were just making him aware of it and wanted to tell him, you know, e even though Jesus was not there with them, they still reached out to him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously you, you can't see Jesus here physically with you today, but you should still reach out to him as well. And, and uh, you know, they, they have a good example to follow here. And that is when you have a problem or when you have an issue that arises in your life. And for these women, it was their brother being sick. But when you have an issue in your life, um, tell Jesus about it. Talk to him about it. And even if you don't know what to ask him or what to say to him, or even if you don't want to ask anything of him or say anything to him, just tell him the situation that you're in. And he knows your heart. I mean, you know, and, and we're going to see a little bit later on in this chapter that even though um, they didn't ask him for anything specific at this point, they had it in their mind that they wanted Jesus to heal them because they remember when when Jesus showed up, they said, you know, if you would have been here earlier, brother would not have died. Right. Meaning that, yeah. well, we, we assumed you were going to heal him. Yeah. But um, at any rate, uh, you know, it's it's good to tell Jesus um, what's on your mind. Right, and trust him. Verse 4. Yeah, when, trust him to make the next move. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with being specific either, because the Bible does say you have not because you ask not, but it's neat to have such a relationship with Jesus and to know him so well that you know you can tell him what your situation is and just trust him to take the ball and run with it. Yeah, and sometimes, especially if you have bad things going on in your life, you may not be in a right frame of mind to be asking for the right thing, so you just tell yeah, him, and he knows what's on your mind as well. It, and what my point was before is even though the sisters didn't ask Jesus for their healing, that is what they wanted, and Jesus knew that's what they wanted even without asking because as we're going to see in a few verses, he ends up going there as well to, uh, to heal them or right. to raise them from the dead. Yeah. And, you know, just getting back to that, it, it's neat because, you know, I think you and I have that with each other that you, you, all you would have to do is tell me what's on your mind, you know, or if something is bothering you or whatever, and I go to work and try to do what I can to fix it. And, and you do the same thing for me. I know you do. I, you know, even if we don't request anything, we kind of know each other well enough and, you know, and, and, we would do what, whatever we could in a given situation. And that's a neat thing to have, you know, between people, but it's, it's, uh, infinitely better to have with Jesus since he just happens to be the, uh, all powerful God. So that helps the cause. And that's the kind of God you have too. That's what people need to remember. Uh, verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And I want to read verse 6 along with that. Um, you uh, you got to read verse 4, yeah. Oh, did I miss that? Yeah, oh, we'll sorry about that. Verse four. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not unto death. Oh, yeah, thanks. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus did not say that Lazarus wouldn't die. Now, look at his words carefully. He didn't say that he would not die. He was saying that 
death would not be the final outcome of this sickness. It's not unto death. It wouldn't be the final outcome. The final outcome of his sickness is not going to be death. It's going to be people marveling over the power of Christ who will raise him from the dead. So you got to be very careful when you look at the Word of God, you know, and don't assume that it's saying something when it's not saying something. Yeah, and the whole story that we're going to see here with Lazarus has one purpose, and that's to bring glory to God. And someone walking with God um, would have no problem with that. Lazarus should have no problem with that. His sister should have no problem with that. You and I should have no problem with that in our own lives. If we're going through a trial or a problem, and it brings about glory to God, then the trial is or was well worth it because God is being glorified. There's a good light being shed on God and, and people are taking notice of him. That's right. Verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now watch this on, on the heels of what he, of what the Bible says there, it says, so when he heard that he was sick, he remained where he was two more days. Now, Jesus loved and Jesus remained where he was do not seem to be compatible. Do they? Um, to you? I mean, at just at first glance, I mean, looking at it from a worldly perspective. No, not from a worldly no, perspective. No, to no. To us, it doesn't. it doesn't seem right. To us, what would seem right in the minds of most people was, Jesus loved Lazarus and Martha and Mary. So he took off right away. You know, he he ran as fast as he could and he didn't stop to get over by him and to help him. But that's because our ways are not always God's ways. God sees the big picture. You know, we see the now. We just see a little snapshot. You know, he sees the whole movie. And yeah, he loved those three people god loves us all the time but god is god that's something to remember he loves us all the time but god is god and his eternal purposes are the center of the of this universe not necessarily our lives not necessarily our comfort his eternal purposes are the center of this universe verse and to, it's important to remember Beneath the surface of every problem in your life, God has a purpose. Yeah, and, and sometimes people ask God for things, and he doesn't respond right away, or the way that we think he should, but that doesn't mean that he still loves us. So you take what you said, and, uh, and, and everything you said is true, but looking at it from a little bit of a different angle as well, um, Jesus heard he was sick and remained where he was, but that didn't mean that he didn't love them. The Bible gives us a reminder in verse 5 that he did love them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Verse 7. <clears throat> verse 7 says, uh, oh, here we go. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you. Are you going there again? So the apostles are nervous about returning to Judea, which is the southern part of Israel, because Jesus is a wanted man there. Now he's talking about going back there. And it, uh, it made the disciples nervous, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's not a good idea um, to correct Jesus, it's not a good idea to correct God. If, if you have to do that or you feel you have to do that, then you should know just by default that you're in the wrong because God never needs to be corrected. So if you ever are thinking that God doesn't know what he's doing or, or you know, well, you know, I, I, we better set Jesus straight here. We better set God straight here. Well, if, if you're if you're trying to do that, well, then you are not correct. Yeah, that's a that's a good principle to hang on to. And in verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. So our Lord's answer to their concern, remember what their concern was, we can't go down there, Lord, because you're a wanted man. 
And his answer is, there's only 12 hours in a day. In other words, sometimes we have to enter danger zones to do God's will. Because our time here is so limited. You know, if we only do what we should do or what is fruitful in the eyes of God when there's no risk involved or when there's no discomfort involved, then we're not going to do a whole lot. Sometimes you do have to enter danger zones. You know, you, you just can't take the nice, comfortable way all the time. Um, you got to follow the leading of God and the Word of God. That's the important thing. Yeah, you can't pick and choose when you can follow Jesus. No. You, you can't choose him when you know to do what he wants you to do when everything is a nice paved roadway for you. Sometimes you have to go off-road and through a swamp and whatever else, it, it very uncomfortable situations. And Jesus did that quite often. Um, the, one of the best examples, maybe the best example of it, is when uh, he was in the garden on, on Holy Thursday. And, uh, yeah. you know, he, he, he could have left, he could have left and he could have gotten away, but he chose to stay there. He took the hard road, which sometimes is the only road to take. And, and in that case it was always good to remember Jesus in the garden when he said, not my will, but your will be done. He's willing to go through a nightmare. Yeah. And some people, some people want you to believe that when you are a Christian, everything is always going to be easy and you're always going to be able to take the easy road, but that's very far from the truth. Brings in a lot of money, though. Yeah, because people want to be comfortable. Because people want to hear that. Verse 10. But if anyone walks during the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And walking in night speaks of not living for Christ, not not living the word of God. And a person like that does is a person who does things his own way instead of God's way. And consequently, as a result, he stumbles around because he doesn't walk in the light of God's word, and that's never good. Verse 11. After he said this, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going that I may awaken him from sleep. I think the disciples must really be confused now. Jesus is going to take us into a danger zone to wake someone up who is simply taking a nap. Yep. <laughs> you know, I wonder what they're thinking. Um, they got to be this is one of those times, one of those many times when you can just see the twelve the twelve disciples scratching their heads. You know, sort of like when something goes wrong and they give that shot of Mike McCarthy on the sidelines. Yeah. It's kind yeah, of like, what in the world is going on here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But it is, it's interesting to see that the, the term that Jesus uses for Lazarus being dead is that he says he's sleeping. Um, because you know, it, Jesus is thinking in terms of eternal things, which is, what we're supposed to do as well, but his disciples, as you say, are thinking in terms of physical, earthly things such as taking a nap. But Jesus doesn't see death that way. Jesus, Jesus sees death as, or, or I, I should say, um, his his disciples see death as being an end. Jesus sees death as um, sleeping. You yeah. know, from from a physical worldly perspective but much more than that in an eternal perspective and i should mention this too whenever the new testament talks about the sleep of death and and it does often talk about death for christians as being sleeping and whenever it talks about the sleep of death it's always just referring to the body not the soul the soul does not go to sleep. There are some who teach that, but that's not what Scripture teaches. So moving on, verse 12. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will be well. In other words, if physical sleep is his only problem, then we don't have to go back there and risk our lives to wake him up, Lord. That's what they're thinking. 
Yeah, they're. Uh, I mean, ba- yeah, they're they're basically thinking everything in just human terms, which I, I guess is understandable here. They're saying, well, you know, if he's if he's sleeping, if he's taking a nap, I mean, that's a good thing that that makes people better, and you know, and you know, he's he's sleeping, and Mary and Martha I mean, maybe made him some chicken soup, and you know, <laughs> then it'll all be better. But that's the way that they're thinking is, you know, if he's sleeping, then he's gonna get better because people get better when they sleep. And as you're talking about that. I was just thinking, how many times have we seen that in the Gospel of John with people where, I mean, it, it hap- where, where Jesus is on is talking spiritual and they're thinking physical. And so they get confused because they don't realize what he's saying. I mean, it happened with Nicodemus when he said, you got to be born again. What? How are you going to get in the womb again and be born again? The woman at the well, give me some of that water, Lord, so I never have to come back here and drink or and, and fetch water anymore. I mean, the disciples several occasions it it just even the religious rulers you know just on different wavelengths different frequencies completely but jesus that doesn't stop jesus though even though they didn't you know jesus could have after the people didn't understand could have just said well you know what you're not worthy to know so forget it i'm just keeping this to myself but he ended up revealing it to them you know he explained it to nicodemus he explained it to that woman he um it, it will explain it here to his he disciples will. yeah notice verse 13 jesus had spoken of his death but they thought that he was speaking of getting rest through sleep and you know what death for christians is like an extended nap for their body our body sleeps until jesus wakes it up and he is going to be the one who wakes it up Jesus has a wake-up call for each and every Christian, for actually for every person in the world. Uh, but we're going to hear his voice, and our bodies are going to come out of the graves. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible but, and, and, it, and it is a rest. When you die, um, you no longer have to worry about your physical condition. I mean, if, you, if you're saved um, and you go to heaven, which you will if you're saved, but, um, you know, when you die, you don't, have to worry about your physical problems you don't have to worry about your financial problems your relationship problems all that is put off to the side and you're in heaven i mean that's that's very um reassuring that's very you know it, it makes you not fear death so much i mean because it is it is actually a good thing it just just like sleeping is a good thing for somebody who's sick death is a good thing for a christian yeah that's good good comparison verse 14 so then jesus plainly told them lazarus is dead and you're going to see that none of the apostles said well how do you know he's dead you're not even there that's kind of a bold thing to say lazarus is dead well you're you're two days journey away or you're you're a day's journey away you're you're a long ways away from him but they didn't question him you know he spoke with authority and they know him well enough now they didn't doubt his word I yeah mean, they didn't say how'd you know right and here's what i was talking about also where you know i said that even though they didn't understand the spiritual things that he was talking about it didn't stop him from further explaining it to him in terms that they could understand yeah verse 15 and i am glad for your sakes that i was not there so that you may believe nevertheless let us go to him. You ever wonder why he said, I was glad that I was not there for your sakes? You think about that at all? Not uh, not really. Well, I think the answer may lie in this. If you search the Bible, you will see that no one ever died in the presence of Jesus. It's never recorded. Hmm. Where anyone ever died in the presence of Jesus. He raised several people from the dead. But no one ever died in the presence of Jesus. And so maybe that's why he was glad that he had not been with Lazarus. If he had been there, I don't know, Lazarus probably would not have died. Jesus, don't you think Jesus would have healed him if he was there? He healed everybody who came to him. He certainly would have healed Lazarus. Yeah, and 
and the disciples knowing that no one ever died with Jesus should give them confidence not just while Jesus is with them but also after he is uh, after he dies and you know um, comes back on Easter Sunday and appears to them and you know and then ascends into heaven that he's never gone should give them comfort you know what I mean should yeah and nothing will happen without his say so but if he doesn't die Jesus doesn't raise him talking about Lazarus and if so Jesus still had it worked out that that he yeah, wouldn't yeah. be there oh yeah so yeah sure because if he doesn't raise someone who's been dead for four days the Apostles faith isn't going to be strengthened like it was right and others would not have believed as much as they did or as many as believed that right we'll see as a result of it either In verse 16 gotta love this then Thomas who is called Didymus said to his fellow disciples let us go also that we may die with him so thomas eh, if you know anything about thomas you know he doesn't say a whole lot but it seems like every time he says something and it's recorded in scripture it's pessimistic and he was full of pessimism and gloom and he is just absolutely sure that jesus will be killed and they will be too if they go with him but he not only believes that Jesus is going to be killed and he's, he's not only sure of that he's sure that he's going to be killed and his friends the apostles and his response is still let's go with them that's the wonderful thing about his devotion to Jesus is that he was willing to go with them anyway yeah that's uh that's very powerful that I mean and and people you know what I mean when you when you look at it it's hard not to see that verse verse 16 and say well thomas was not you know very positive person which personally i don't care about one way or the other but no i don't but, it, but it's but it's easy to look at that and say well boy he, he sure is being a downer let us go also that we may die with him but but you think about what he's saying what he really believes like you said he really truly believes that if he goes with jesus he's going to die but what does he stay uh say he still says let us go also yeah. and he was encouraging jesus other yeah. disciples to go as well it wasn't just gonna be him he's saying you guys come along too yeah so and let's be there for him and let's be there with him why why are, why do we want to stick around if he's not gonna be here with us yeah i mean all that is packed into that verse it is yeah you could talk on that verse for a long time he actually thought he was walking into a death trap sure death but no he was willing to follow jesus there and i suppose it's best not to be pessimistic but look that's like you said i don't care if he was pessimistic or not i mean some people are pessimistic some people are not it takes all kinds I, and and god made makes us all unique and thomas thought he was living in reality yeah yeah that's just how he saw things and i suppose for for our own happiness sake it's best not to be pessimistic but the important thing is to be loyal to jesus no matter how we feel that's the really important thing and that's you can learn a pretty good lesson from Thomas, can't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and it's a little bit different than his situation where he doubted Jesus. I mean, Jesus never said here. You know, when Jesus was raised from dead, people told him, "Well, Thomas, or you know, we we seen Jesus," and he's, "Well, I don't believe it." You know, um, this is different. That Jesus never said that if we go here, we won't die. Right. They the remember his disciples said, "Well." Um, you know why why do you want to go back there they were just trying to kill you there and you're wanted there why do you want to go back jesus never said well we won't die if we go don't worry guys yeah, he never did so so thomas thomas didn't know jesus never corrected that's that that's true so they they didn't know they didn't um want to thank you for listening to our live broadcast here today um want to remind you if you uh want to send us your financial support which is always greatly appreciated you can write us post office box 2211 wasa wisconsin 54402 again that's post office box 2211 wasa wisconsin 54402 you can also uh, go to the scripture verse by verse website it's the bible verse by verse.com that is the bible verse by verse.com if you want to send financial support there's a donate uh, button right on the home page of the bible verse by verse.com um also we appreciate and are in much need of your 
uh, prayers as well for the support of this ministry. Please pray uh, pray for us. And uh, if you want to contact us as well, you can do that. Um, you can write us verse by verse at live.com, verse by verse at live.com. Also give us a call 715-845-8298. That's going to do it for this week's broadcast. And uh, we will be back with you next week for more live scripture verse by verse.